Today's scripture text is the story of the wise men. And this is one of our favorites at Christmas. The story of these three wise men, or however many there actually were, who journeyed to Bethlehem to give gifts to this newborn king. A careful look at the story in Matthew's Gospel shows that the greatest gift in this story is not what the wise men brought to give. It is the gift that they received. So let us pray. <coughs> Holy God, we give you thanks for this day, for this word to us, for this time of year when we celebrate your arrival. Lord, we pray that your word would arrive in our hearts. You would plant it deeply there and cause it to grow and bear fruit for your kingdom. We ask this by your Holy Spirit and in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're reading today from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. Now when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them, until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. <clears throat> then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Again, this is the word of the Lord. During my undergrad at Fresno State, I was a psychology major, and in one of our classes we read a book called The Pursuit of Happiness, Discovering the Pathway to Fulfillment, Well-Being, and Enduring Personal Joy. It was a great book to read. It's, it, uh, in the book, the author discusses what is it that actually makes people happy. And it wasn't a self-help book or here's my opinion of what makes people happy. It was all based on solid psychological research. What factors actually do contribute to helping people be happier? They looked at all kinds of things, from the amount of money you have, to the size of your family, to the birth order you might be in your family. All these different factors, how do they contribute to happiness? And of course, the fun part of the book was that he took some ideas that we all have that we would think, oh yes, certainly this would make us happy, and shows, well, actually the research says that it doesn't have any effect at all on our happiness, or maybe it has a negative effect on our happiness. But then he finds some other factors that we might easily overlook, small things, simple things, that have a profound impact on how happy we tend to be. Now all of us engage in this pursuit, the pursuit of happiness. I like to think of it more in terms of the pursuit of joy. <coughs> Happiness is a word that we sometimes get confused about because sometimes we just mean the surface level emotion. Other times we, we might mean something deeper, but oftentimes happiness is just this fleeting emotion that we have. But joy is something that goes quite a bit deeper. For example, the, the brief emotion of happiness is something that you typically don't feel at the same time as feeling sad. You can feel happy or sad, usually not both. But joy is something that gets deep down into your soul. And it is possible to feel joy even while feeling sad. And so that's why I think joy is what we are actually pursuing in our lives. This is what we want. We want to find this deep and lasting joy that can even carry us through times 
of sadness. And so we all pursue this joy in one way or another. Now, as the author addressed in, in the book that I mentioned, there are a lot of myths out there about how we do this, about how we pursue joy, how we actually find joy in life. There are thousands of different voices out there that are telling us how we can find joy, telling us how they found joy. Whether it's a self-help book or a commercial we see on TV, there are all kinds of things that tell us, here's how you find joy. These voices tell us that we can find joy in freedom, or in family, or in achieving the American dream. They tell us that we can find joy in financial success and wealth, but then some voices tell us we can find joy by living a more simple life and not having as much. They tell us that joy can be found in hard work. And sometimes those same voices also say that joy can be found when you work hard so that you can retire and have a perpetual vacation for 20 years and not joy in work and joy in not working. I mean, there are so many voices out there, sometimes you have to stop and ask, well, maybe the key to having joy is just writing my own book on how to find joy, so I can be my own authority on it. There are a lot of different myths about how to find joy. And so it's hard for us to know which path do we take. How do we try and pursue joy? The wise men set out on their own path to find the newborn king of the Jews. They set out on this path because, as the story says, they saw his star when it rose, or they saw his star in the east. Now these wise men were magi. That's the Greek word for it, and it's an interesting word. We translate it wise men, but oftentimes it's translated magician. These were non-Jews. They were Gentiles from the region of Persia, probably. They were astrologers. Back then, astronomy and astrology were the same discipline. And so these wise men studied the stars not just because they were curious, but because they believed the stars had a message to reveal something about their lives and about uh, the meaning of, of the world. And so it was almost like a religious enterprise that they were involved in. So, you can understand how the Jewish people who worship the one God who had revealed himself to them would not like the idea of magi, these Gentile, maybe somewhat superstitious magicians being the first to come and pay homage to the Messiah. This is part of the interesting thing that Matthew and that God is doing. Most of that's for another sermon another time. What I want to focus on is the devotion that these wise men had to their profession. You've seen the sky, you know how many stars there are up there. These wise men knew the stars so well that when there was one new one, they noticed it. Now, some people have said, oh, maybe it was a supernova or a comet or something big, but we don't know, that may be not. Whatever it was, they paid attention. They were devoted to their profession, devoted to what they did. And so they noticed this star. It occurs to me that, that maybe sometimes we pursue joy kind of like the wise men did. By devoting ourselves to something. Maybe you've devoted yourself to your career or to your education. Maybe you've devoted yourself to a certain relationship. Your relationship with your spouse, with your kids, with your family, your friendships. Or maybe you find joy by devoting yourself to a cause. Homelessness. People not having enough to eat, human trafficking, foster children, all kinds of different causes out there that you could devote your life to. And whatever it is, you, you pursue this thing, you chase this star, hoping that it will lead you to the joy that you're after. Now I'll be the first one to say that this kind of a pursuit is good. And there is much joy to be found, especially when you devote yourself to something that's beyond just yourself, right? There's a lot of joy to be found in it. But no matter how noble your devotion might be, it will only take you so far on that path to the real joy you're after. <coughs> if all we have is our own pursuit, it is still very easy to get lost. And that's what happened to the wise men. 
Matthew says that they followed the star, they went west from Persia, they reached the land of Palestine. And then the next thing he tells us is that they were asking for directions. They didn't see the star anymore. They didn't know where to go after that. They didn't know what the next step was, and so they were a bit lost. I mean, they knew where they were, but not where else to go after they got there. So they did what makes sense. They went to the capital city, Jerusalem, and they asked for directions. Which is enough to make you wonder, maybe there were some wise women in the group. <laughs> and so you see, no matter how devoted you are, you only get to a certain point. At some point you need something else to lead you all the way in to the joy that you seek. This brings us to Herod, King Herod. The wise men started asking people in town where the king of the Jews had been born, and this got everybody talking about it. Eventually, Herod heard about it. Matthew says that when Herod, who thought he was king, by the way, of the Jews, when King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. I think you can see why this would be troubling for Herod. He is the king of the Jews, and so if you're asking about this new king of the Jews, that's going to make any king nervous, but it says that people were troubled with him. Even though this should have been good news for them, they were waiting for the Messiah to come, this should have been good news, but you have to know who Herod was. See, the people were troubled because they were afraid of how Herod was going to react. Herod was an incredible king. There were a lot of Herods in history. This particular one is Herod the Great, and he's king at the time that Jesus was born. He was great in many ways. I mean, he, he accomplished more in the city of Jerusalem and the surrounding area than many people before him could have, could have ever dreamed. He rebuilt and expanded the second temple so that it was this magnificent wonder of the world. And the, the west wall, the wall that's in Jerusalem today, was part of the foundation on which that temple was built. He built entire cities. He brought clean water, clean, sustainable water systems to the city. He did these great public works. Now, they came at a cost. There were a lot of taxes that had to be paid, but he did some amazing things with those taxes. Herod was also paranoid. He was very, very afraid. He readily killed people for any reason at all. He had killed three of his sons had them executed because he was afraid that they might try and take the throne from him. And on the day that Herod the Great died, he ordered that all of the elite citizens of Jerusalem be executed at the moment of his death just so that there would be crying when he died. This is Herod the Great. So when the wise men come and ask, hey, where has the new king of the Jews been born? You can understand why it was troubling for everyone. What is Herod going to do? I'm sure that Herod knew very little joy in life. And I think it's because he pursued joy not by devoting himself to something, but by hoping and demanding that everybody else and everything else devote themselves to him. It's another way of, of pursuing joy. Herod is a perfect picture of our original sin which is our desire to be God and to be worshipped. Have others devote themselves to us. I mean, that's what happened in the garden. We rejected God's sovereignty. We said, we don't want you to be God. We want to take the fruit and become gods ourselves. And we became infected with this sinful self-centeredness that has stuck with us to this day. And it wants to run the show of our lives, which means that we also want to run the show of other people's lives. We want to be in charge. Our sin is wanting to be king and wanting others to be devoted to us. At times, we have all pursued joy like hair, if we're honest. Granted, we have not had our children executed and done these horrible things that we read about and that we know about Herod, but but we are not as innocent as we like to think we are. Maybe there's a relationship in your life that you've held hostage. Because there's been some pain or hurt in the past and you will not, you refuse to take steps 
to heal that relationship until they admit they're wrong and submit to you. Or maybe, maybe it's not a relationship that's been damaged. Maybe you're just anxious of losing the power or the security that you have at this point in your life. Even whether it's a lot or a little, you're afraid of losing. And that, that can be anything. That can be relationships. It can be money, reputation, all kinds of different things we hold on to because we think they will make our life safe. Maybe you're afraid of losing them. Even at the expense of loving your family or your neighbors, just like Ebenezer Scrooge in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Scrooge who drives away his beloved Belle because he is so concerned about having financial security. When you're worried like this and when you're anxious like this, any and every change that comes into your life is a threat. Even if it's a good change, a good announcement, where is the king of the Jews? It's a threat to you. It's a threat to your way of life. But the more tightly you cling to your old wounds or to your safety nets, the more the joy you seek will slip right through your fingers. The way of Herod will never lead you to joy. After Herod consults with the Jewish leaders, the pastors and the seminary professors of their time, he learns that the Christ is to be born in Bethlehem. It's a small little town. So he gives the wise men directions and orders them to go to Bethlehem, find the child, and then come back and tell him so that he also can, can go and worship. When the wise men reach Bethlehem, so they're following Herod's directions at this point. They reach out to him. Then Matthew says they see the star again. Suddenly the star seems to reappear and somehow it points them right to the exact house that Jesus is in. They're on the doorstep when they see the star confirming that they are in the right place. And then they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After months of traveling, traveling, maybe even years of traveling, the wise men finally realized something very crucial, which is that they have not been pursuing joy. They have not been the ones pursuing this newborn king of the Jews. God is the one who has been pursuing them from the beginning. That's the discovery that leads them to joy. The discovery that it's it's not their pursuit. God has been pursuing them. So often we think that Christianity is about our pursuit. Don't we? No matter what theology, our theology might say, oh yeah, it's all God, it's all grace, but the way we actually live. We sometimes live as though it is up to us. It's our pursuit, it's our quiet times, our knowledge of the Bible, our devotion that takes us to God, that takes us to this little house in Bethlehem where we hope to find some joy. That's not what Christianity is about. That is certainly not what Advent is about. It's about God's pursuit of us. We're not on a journey that's taking us heavenward. God is on a journey to earth, to rescue us, to redeem us and to restore us. That is Advent. God becoming human, honoring humanity, blessing humanity. It is God's pursuit of us, not our pursuit of God. <coughs> now when the wise men came to the house, they're standing outside on the doorstep, Matthew says they stepped inside and worshipped the boy Jesus. What a great metaphor for us in our pursuit of joy. No matter how long you've been searching, how far you've been traveling, at some point when you make the discovery that God has been searching for you, step inside and worship. That's how you complete the act of receiving God's gift of joy. Just step inside and worship this newborn king. Let yourself be the one who is found by this Savior. 
so that you can have the joy for which you long. You can't earn joy, and you can't dig it up like a treasure. Joy can only be received as a gift. And that's why this Christmas, this Advent, our whole lives, it's not about the gifts that you bring. It is about the gift that God brings to you. And that is good news for all of us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.